about that. Welcome everyone uh, to the Developing Sakai Dashboards, Web Components, and Widgets session. Um, the presenter today is Adrian Fish, my colleague from Longsight. Um, so just a few housekeeping details. Please um, be sure to leave yourselves muted and cameras off. That should be locked, but um, you don't want to turn those on during the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, um, wait until either the question and answer portion of the presentation, or you can use the shared notes in the left-hand um, menu bar. Um, so above the user list, you can uh, click there to ask your questions. You want to use the chat primarily for chat and post any questions in the shared notes area so that we can find them a little bit easier. Um, and if you have any technical issues, please send me a, um, a direct message. You can do an a, a individual chat by clicking on the username. So I'm Wilma Hodges. Um, click on my name and send me a direct message if you're having any technical issues, and I'll try to help you out any way I can. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Adrian. OK, thank you, Wilma. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Adrian Fish, and I, uh, I work for Longsight. And I've been doing um, quite a bit of work on things like the new dashboards and uh, Grader and quite a, quite a lot of front end stuff, right? So this presentation is hopefully going to give you a little bit of insight into how to maybe do some of this stuff yourselves, right? That's that's, that's the goal, right? So I'm just going to get into it. I want to go through some slides and then hopefully towards the end, in the last few minutes, I'll, I'll look at a bit of code, right? And uh, we can check out some of, the, some of the code in some of the dashboard widgets that we've already got in place. Off we go. Okay, so we're using web components. Why, why are we doing that? What's, what's, what's the kind of reasoning behind that, right? Well, first of all, web components are future-proof. Uh, you can use them anywhere. You can use them in frameworks like React or Vue or whatever. You can use them just in a normal web page. Um, they're a web, you know, they're a web standard. They're a W3C standard. Well, actually, it's a group of standards together, right? But they are a W3C standard. They're going to be with us into the future of the internet, right? Of the World Wide Web. So it's, I think, it's a good choice. Um, web components are particularly good. Um, for us in Sakai, right? Because we've got all these diverse um, frameworks that we use for rendering content. So, you know, we've got kind of, kind of JSF, you know, Velocity, Wicket, RSF, you know, loads of stuff like that, right? So the good thing about web components is you can write a web component and it's just a tag and the tag will work. It'll work in, in a Vue app or a React app or anywhere, basically. So, um, you know, it, it works everywhere. And we can put it in Velocity, we can stick it in our JSF markup. It doesn't really matter. It'll it'll work. It'll work uh, wherever you put it. So again, it's great because that means that we can start to actually think in terms of um, extracting common functionality from our tools into web components without having to rewrite the entire tool, right? You know, which I, I think is a pretty useful thing. Um, yeah, the, you know, the way you develop a web component, you you basically, you write some markup and then you have a few fetch calls in there where you pull some data, you know, you render the data. I mean, we've already got a lot of that stuff in place uh, with our direct endpoints, right? You, you can write, you could write web components just to talk to our current direct, you know, direct endpoints uh, and it'll work just fine, yeah? Um, I've been working on a new, a kind of a new um, Spring MPC type location for, um, for implementing REST endpoints, and it's under the um, it's under the um, Path API. The actual project's called Web API. But I'll show you this. I'll show you that kind of stuff later. Yeah, just fetch your data and render it. You know, it's pretty easy doing these things once you start. Once you write a web component, you can use it anywhere. Yep, it's just a tag. So let's move on. So uh, this is the example that I always I always kind of like um, invoke in these in these talks uh, because it's, a, it's it's perfect you know it's uh, the permissions web component so anybody who's done any any um, you know Sakai tool development in the past is probably aware of this kind of um, helper pattern that we have right so we have a we have a pattern where we we basically offload 
um, the current render to a uh, to a helper servlet, right? And that servlet will do some stuff, uh, and then it'll return back to the sender. Yeah, um, it's, 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 I mean, it's it's great. It's it's, it's served as well. Um, but what you often end up with is having you have to maintain quite a lot of state in between those calls and make sure that you reset that state or you know reinsert that state and, and things like that. Yeah? So permissions was one of those helpers. So basically what, what I did was I took the markup from our from the current helper, right? Which was like a it was like um like a velocity template, right? So I took I took that markup, um, I made it into a web component. And now that web component you used across quite a few tools. Um, I think announcements uses it, I think assignments uses it, the commons tool uses like, quite a few tools are basically now using this web component to do permissions. And this is this this is good because what you don't what you can get away you, you can throw away a lot of state by doing that, right? You don't you you you're not redirecting to a helper and then coming back and having to pick up state again. Literally the tag just renders, it renders into a div on the screen. You you pick some options in it and that uses fetch to write those options back to an endpoint. Right, and then the permissions are then set. Right, so it's been it's a perfect example of taking a common piece of uh, functionality, um, putting into a web component, and throwing away some boilerplate. It's nice. It's it's that that is that is one of the things I love about um, using web components in Sakai. It lets us re, you know refactor, get rid of um, you know get rid of technical debt. It's it's great. Uh, yeah, some blur there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, permissions tiger. Okay, he can read that later. Okay, anatomy of a Sakai web component. Right, so we're using a. Um, I don't really like using the word framework because framework implies something heavy and something that usually becomes technical debt later, right? But so lit element is like it's like a micro framework, right? And it's a it's a framework that is designed. You know, destined to eventually disappear, right? It's it's, it's maintained by uh, a guy from Google who wrote it, um, and they basically they 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 eventually want this to go. This is this is just a way of um, gradually improving the standards in the W three C and browser support for web components, right? Making it easier to use web components. Yeah. Um, so it's a great it's a great it's a great little little tool, right? Um, it gives you um, it gives you reactivity. So when you set up properties in your web component, uh, you change those properties, your markup will change automatically. That that kind of stuff, right? Um, it's nice anyway. But again, uh, we'll look at some code later, and uh, you, you'll 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 understand better. Yeah, a basic component is literally an ES6 class. Um, so if nobody knows what ES6 is, ES6 is the JavaScript standard from 2015, right? Where they actually added uh, class semantics onto JavaScript. It was the first time you could step away from, from using prototypes all the time, yeah? Most of it is just syntactic sugar, right? But it, it bridges the world between JavaScript developers and Java developers, or, or any, well, you know, whatever C sharp developers, whatever, right? The syntax is quite familiar to someone who comes from a uh, object oriented background in like Java or C sharp, yeah. So um, it's, it's nice. So it's, it's it's a lot it's a lot easier writing JavaScript. You don't have to be such a, a kind of a kind of guru, right? You know, like understanding prototypes really well, all that stuff. You can get away with a lot more. Um, you know, a lot, there's a lot more leeway in, in, in the way you write these things. Yeah, it's just an ES6 class. Um, you define your tag and you have a render method in it. And then you can use that tag. That's all you need to do. That's just the basics. You can use that tag then anywhere, yeah? After that, you start to kind of flesh it out. Uh, you put your reactive stuff in, you know, the watched properties. Um, you know, you add attributes. Um, you add internationalization. But the basic thing is just literally it's an ES6 class um, with a render method and a definition for the tag. It's great. Right. Okay. Um, so anatomy of a Sakai tool. 
WC style. That's not that's not water closet. That's web components. It's just important that you. I'm not talking about toilets. Okay. Um, <laughs> what can you do? You know, you've only got so much room on a slide. You know. <laughs> Uh, right. Okay. So, um, so this is this is like this is uh, I've literally just written this slide. Right. This this is the um, this is kind of what's in a Sakai tool when you when you when you use web components. Yeah. Well, what this this is what's been in the ones that I've been writing. Yeah. So, one to many web components, um, communicating via attributes and events, uh, some translations. Uh, you'll have some REST controllers, which is using a technology called Spring MVC. Uh, you'll have a service, you'll have some tests, you know, no excuse not to write tests anymore. We've got nice things like Mokito and stuff like that. Um, you'll have some JPA entity beans for your database stuff. So you don't need to write, uh, Hibernate XML anymore. It's a lot nicer. You just, you just write a, a Java bean with annotations, um, to, to kind of define what the columns are going to do. Yeah. And then you'll have one to many JPA repositories. Um, yeah, I'll talk about the Spring CRUD repository a little bit later. It's just getting into code a bit. Okay, yeah, yeah, later, later. All right, cool. Um, yeah, that's 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 the kind of that's usually what you end up with, right? So the reason you you'd have, let's like, say, you were writing a tool, right? You, you might think, well, why have we got a lot of web components? I think it's nice to have a good few web components because you encapsulate markup in a web component. So instead of having a lot of markup in one big thing, like, a, like I know we use macros and stuff in velocity, right? But like, so, you know, so, so, say you've got a lot of markup in, in one page, right? It's nice to, to actually break it up into tags. And that's what web components in the end, that's what they are, they're tags, right? And each of those tags is responsible for its own area of the markup you don't have to reuse those across the car to justify actually breaking your monolithic chunk of markup up into some separate web components that just communicate with each other i think i think it's, i think it's a nice it's a nice approach plus you can you can kind of like test each of those individually as well right you know what i mean you can have a story for each of those things we'll get to stories later but um, but you know, you don't have to reuse web components. You can just say this tool has twenty web. Like Rubrics is a classic example. Rubrics has a load of web components. Um, you may think, well, there's why is there so many web components in there? I've thought it many times, but I mean, I think there could be a few less web components in Rubrics. But you know, the strategy of having a set of web components that just work together, but they've got their own chunk of the markup that they're rendering. I don't, I don't think it's a bad strategy at all. I think it makes it easier to, uh, you know, to, to load up the code in an editor and, and make sense of what's going on, right? When the tag, you know, there's just one tag. So anyway, moving on. Uh, right, okay. Um, yeah, right. So I'm going through the steps here of, um, you know how you go about you know what what you need to actually do to uh you know to go down this path right so the, the first thing I, I work from the front to the back right that's that's what i usually do right so i mean and with things like storybook i think it's, it's it's a great approach to it so i don't initially think of the back end stuff right so typically i've been working with um designers so obviously they are working out the front, right? They're doing the design. So it makes it makes a lot of sense when you're working with a designer to start from the front. But to honestly, I always have. I'll think about the front end uh, movement between screens, and uh, and then I'll I'll, I'll kind of like propagate that back into REST controllers, and I'll propagate that further back into a service. Uh, you know, then I run a test. You know, when I've written the service or a test before, really, that's what you should do. That's what you should do. Um, so yeah, so you, you create your basic web component and again, it's literally such a small amount of code just to create the basic tag. You just create an ES, an ES6 class and you register the tag name, right? You define the tag name. So, so the browser knows about it and you render something in your render method. You can just hello world. It's whatever bare, bare text. It's fine. That's, that's how you want to start, right? Just create that basic thing so we know it's going to render. Yeah. 
the next thing I would do is I would um, I would get to know Storybook. Um, if you go into our um, our Git repo, the Sakai the Sakai Git repo, there's a project called Web Components, and under there there's a project called Tool, and under there if you keep drilling in you'll find a you'll find a directory called Front End. And that is where all the kind of um, NPM type stuff is like package JSON and all that. And our stories are also in there, right? So, you know, I recommend going, actually going in, you know, if, if, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, whatever kind of platform you're working on, but particularly if you're working on Sakai, I recommend going in into that, those directories and having a, having a look around and seeing uh, how the land lies with that stuff. So you create a basic story now. You've got your component. Um, you've called it whatever, it just renders hello world. Yeah. So the next thing you want to do is actually create a story to render it on the screen, right? Because you want to start you want to start round tripping on um, you know adding content to it and things. Yeah. So you want know, you want to check it works in the first place at all, right? The browser knows about the tag, um, you know, and storybook can then render it and you know you've got a working tag, yeah. Yeah, I've been creating these subdirectories on the stories now. You know, if, I'm, if if I think there's going to be a fair bit of stuff for that component, uh, you know, translations or whatever, then I think it's it's a good idea to actually create a subdirectory under there and try and structure because it, the stuff that's under web components is growing massively, right? You know, it's like you know a lot of this stuff is still emergent. Right? I'm trying to do these talks and trying to kind of help people along on this path, right? But a lot of this stuff is still emerging. It's emerging still with me, and I've still got things that I feel I want to. I want to bottom out and work out how, what is the best approach for them, right? But um, so it's a bit of a journey, yeah. But so I'm just trying. I'm just trying my best here. But I think I think that you know, creating a subdirectory of the stories where you're going to put your story data. So I mean, you may you, you'll put typically you'll put styles on under your story directory. You'll put uh, data mocked up data under your story directory um, and you'll put translations under your story directory as well so there's quite a lot of stuff that's specific to your component needs to be created and so it makes sense to create a directory um yeah there's the path right so you run storybook so your sakai source route whatever that is web components tool source main front end uh, and then there's a script i've set up a script called storybook uh, in there so all you have to do is go npm run storybook and hopefully it'll take a while because it kind of like it pulls quite a lot of stuff from um, from npm but uh when you run that you'll get a tab opening up in your browser um with all the kind of like uh, stories down the left hand side with when the story for your new component should be there we're going to look at some code later um right okay let's go Later, well, we've got not that long, really. But, uh, right, okay. Give me that later. Yeah, back end stuff, right? So you can round trip a lot on 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 design. So if you're working with a design, a storybook is great because you can have two screens. Um, you can be working on your component in one. Um, you might be using something like um, Zeppelin or Figma. From your designer where your designer's putting mock-ups in there um and typically what you'll do is you'll wrap your round trip in storybook for a, quite a good while right you'll you'll mock up some data in there and you'll be just you'll be just basically you know copying style sheets in from from figma or zeppelin and you'll be um you know just, just building the design up right and then working out what your endpoints are going to be from that design as well right so while you're working on these things in storybook what you're effectively doing is you're specking up your endpoints as well, which is a great thing because the next stage after this is going to be working on my like REST controllers and you've already got your endpoints because you've had to mock them up in Storybook, yeah? Um, yeah, I'm going to skip that. That's, I mean, that's, that's stuff about shadow DOM and live DOM and styles and stuff. I mean, I just recommend you kind of Google that, you know. It's, it's pretty heavy stuff. Uh, the, you know, the... the, the um, you know the, the the long and short of it is shadow dom's great because everything's scoped you can just use whatever ids you want in your markup it doesn't matter right they're not going to leak outside they're not going to clash great stuff but 
Shadow DOM doesn't work great with Seek Editor or with jQuery Dialogues or anything that tries to inject markup into the body. It always breaks. So that's the, uh, yeah, there you go. Right, so the elephant in the room, right, front-end build chain is the elephant in the room. So we, we are, so if anybody knows, has done some front-end stuff, right, there's this thing called bare paths, right, which is a Node.js thing. Um, so Node has got this lookup system, right, because it's got access to your file system, and you can just say import uh, widget, right, just a string called widget, right, and Node will know to look up and down in its, um, in its modules that it's got stored there, and it will find widgets, and it'll know which thing to bring in, right? The browser does not know how to do that, and this is always the tension at the, at the moment in front-end development. So you've got a tool called Empathize, um, which basically finds the bare paths and rewrites them as browser, you know, browser URLs, right? Sometimes it doesn't work perfectly. This is the trouble, right? So um, sometimes the road can be rocky. The guy that wrote Node.js is basically is writing a replacement for, for the Node package manager called Dino. So he's obviously, you know, he obviously knows his issues down the line between browsers and Node, right? So he's actually written a replacement. So, um, yeah, it's not pleasant. Uh, right, okay, I'm going to quickly, I'm going to quickly... Well, we can either we can either we can either quickly look at a bit of code, right? Or um, I can take questions. It's probably one or the other. With the time, so um, code plus ones, please. Right, sweet. We're doing code then. Right, cool. I just need to try and uh, see if I can kind of get out of that. Reshare. Reshare my screen. Hang on. So I'll stop sharing. Uh, reshare. Right, I don't know. Mm, that's not great, is it? Let's see if I can get the font up a bit. All right, <laughs> still looks small there. Eh? I'm trying to make it a bit bigger. Ugh, that's what I have to do. Okay, right, so, 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 right. So this is uh, one of the dashboard widgets, okay? Um, the announcements widget. Um, I'll go from top to bottom. Right? So up here, this is where we're, we're just basically import. So it's all ES six kind of like import uh, module import syntax, right? So we're bringing in a couple of um, um, the template literals from the Lit Element project. I'm bringing in our own Sakai icon, right? Which is a wrapper for Font Awesome. I'm bringing in a uh, special element that we've got called a pageable element. Now, if anybody's looked at the dashboards recently, you'll see that there's paging in there, right? Um, and that comes from this pageable element. Um, this is an ES6 class. So you export it in case you want to reuse this particular symbol, right? Export class, Sakai announcements extends Sakai pageable element, right? It all looks very, you know, very C sharp, very Java. It's, uh, you know, it's nice. You've got a constructor, you call a super class, you call a super on it. Um, this is how we're doing translations. Yeah, this is using something called uh, Sakai-i18n.js, right? And it's actually, it's actually put in the base class for us, yeah. All, all this is load translations. What you're doing is you are basically loading properties files, just like any other Sakai tool, and they're you know they're managed by the uh, message bundle manager in the same way. So, you know, if you have local translations that you're modifying in the message bundle manager, these components will pick that up. It's going it's going through exactly the same route, right? Um, this is 
called a setter, right? This is how you this is how you do setters and getters in in the in the S six. Um, so this is where we're pulling the announcements data, we're setting the data, and then this will trigger a re-render. Yeah. So typically you do a lot of this. You, if you have attributes on your tag and you want something to happen, right, after the attribute is set, then what you do is you create a setter for it and you just put that here, right? So when when somebody you know uses your tag and they put the attribute in there, whatever it might be, site ID or whatever, right? If you set up a setter here for that for that attribute you can do stuff in response to it being set on your tag which is great so these are these these setters and getters are really really powerful things and i i, I use them a hell of a lot um there's other ways of reacting to attributes being changed but i, I think setters and getters are the, are the are the nicest way um this stuff's like too complicated to talk about now i load all day so this is this is to do with pageable um so a kind of pageable element or well, this load all data so this is this is my attempt to put a little bit of um, plumbing in around you know paging data um yeah these are sorting stuff so right so this 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 is an example of a render method um or content here because the render is actually happening in the base class and the base class calls this right calls this content method yeah so you, you implement this in your uh, subclasses but the structure inside is is what you've seen a render so this html thing here right this is a um this is a tagged a tagged template literal right and this comes from lit element um actually it comes from lit, lit HTML, but this, this comes from for, for all, all intents and purposes this comes from lit, lit element so you just go return html you open it with a back tick uh, and you put your markup in. See this stuff here, right? You see these, right? These here are your watch properties. You know, so these are like observed properties or sometimes they're called reactive properties, right? This means that when this site ID changes anywhere in, in the code, right? Or by setting an attribute, this portion of the code where this is referenced will re-render just that portion. This is what's so nice about lit, lit elements and lit HTML. They're really, really fast because they literally they maintain a reference of where these um, attributes are used, and they only re-render that piece. Very, very, very precise. There's no virtual DOM needed. Nothing like that, right? And it's, it's it's quick, and it's so easy to use. So, so I'm saying, you know, all this stuff inside is JavaScript. These things are JavaScript. This is all JavaScript, right? But it's using um, HTML5 templates under the covers, right? So it's all it's all JavaScript inside. There's no extra template language. There's no the full power of JavaScript is available in here, and I think it's great. I think it's just great. Um, this is where I'm grabbing some um, some translations. So I'm loading the translations into this thing here, i18n, yeah, uh, which is an object, and then these are the translation keys, yeah. Again, they're just from properties files, just like any any of our Java apps. Yeah. Um, let's keep going down. This is this is probably good. Let's just going through this kind of stuff. Um, one minute left. Okay, good. Um, again, look. I mean, you know, this is getting a bit more complex. But as you can see, it's just JavaScript. The whole thing is JavaScript inside here. You know, uh, styles. Okay, I'll briefly say so. This is a shadow DOM component, um, and this is how you write styles. These styles get shared across all instances of your component, so they're pretty efficient. Um, and they only apply to the markup in your component. They don't bleed out anywhere outside of the shadow DOM. But it is a really nice way, but it doesn't sit very well with our SAS build. That's 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 the caveat for this. You know, our SAS stuff doesn't get in here, so you have to pass things in as CSS properties like this. Keep going until I run out of time. I'll keep going. I'll pop out one second left. <laughs> right, this is how you define your component, right? Your tag. So there's a thing called window.customElements, right? And uh, this is how the browser gets to find out about new elements. So what I'm saying here is if Sakai announcements has not been defined yet, right? Then define it. Just pass an ME class in like that. And then after that, the browser will know you'll be able to use it wherever. Yeah. I think that's me. I think that'll do. I think that'll do for now.
Well, we are out of time, yep. um, although we are coming up on a break. So um, there's a 15-minute break before the plenary session. So if anybody had any burning questions, we, we probably have a little bit of time to answer that. Yeah, OK. Yeah, there's a lot of information. I mean, I know that. So, uh, I'm on, I'm on, you know, I'm on the, I'm on Slack. I'm on the Aperio Slack, and uh, you can grab me on there. My email address is on the slides. So, well, thank you, Adrian. That was a uh, very. Um, it's hard to pack all that into 30 minutes. So you did a very good job yeah. conveying yeah, a lot of technical information very quickly. But do follow up with him on Slack. Um, and we have the developer office hours now um, every week. So that's another place you can catch um, Adrian if you have technical questions. So thanks, yeah. everybody. And um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yep. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you, everybody.